Hey class, and welcome to lecture 12 as we're closing out module number four. And to go ahead and start looking at Ephesians chapter four as we continue here in uh, verse number 22. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. So our three major points here, very simply, as we're looking through this lecture, is we are to be putting off, putting on, and putting away. You know what's been said concerning the Christian life. Now we're in this section on our conduct matching our calling, walking worthy. It's been said concerning the Christian life is not how high you jump, but how straight you walk when your feet hit the ground. I've seen many come to Christ that, and be moved, but not moving forward. A walk is a step-by-step -step journey. In the recovery community that I'm involved in, we use the term baby steps. Here's the first few steps you put off, put on, and put away. What does that mean? How do we understand this? Illustration the Apostle Paul uses is an old garment that's tattered and infested. Put off. You're going to put off that old garment, put on, and put away. Think about dirty clothes. If you're to keep on dirty clothes and not put off, if you put it off, you, you need to put something on, and then you need to put that away and make it a clear transition. So, Roman number one, put off the old man. Verse 22 speaks of being corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Look at that description, the old man. It's not a disrespectful term for a father. It's a descriptive term for who you used to be. It can be tied generationally towards the natural bent of sin. The old man ultimately is the fallen father or Adam, the one who sinned. Going further back than then Adam, even you're the devil, before you're saved, you're, as Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're ever father of the devil. Literally, though, more than that, generationally, it speaks of the man of old. It's more than just the old man. It's the nature of a lifestyle, a former conversation. It is an old way of life and thinking that is corrupt according to deceitful lust. The old man, the old lifestyle will lead you wrong every time and lie to you. Have you ever seen an old picture uh, that you don't like to look at? And that's what's here. Paul is telling and testifying. There's a portrait here that's shared of what you used to look like. This is the before of the before and after photos, okay? So let's take, take a look, closer look at this before photograph. Uh, verse 17, okay, look back at verse number 17. It says that this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. He says, right now, henceforth, after hearing this, don't walk the way you used to. Don't follow the world. Here's the picture, letter A, shallowness. The world walks in the vanity of their mind. The emptiness is the shallowness of their mind. Solomon uses the term vanity of vanity. All is vanity and vexation of spirit. Romans 8.20 describes the disappointing misery of the creation, the result of the curse, the creature being subject to vanity. 2 Peter 2.19 speaks of false teachers speaking great swelling words of vanity. So emptiness, nothingness, aimlessness, shallowness, pointlessness, self-centered emptiness. So verse 18, not just shallowness, uh, letter B, speaks of sightlessness, blindness, Verse 18 says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The idea is you were living blindfolded in a world of illusion. You couldn't see. You were blind. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we were blind before we were saved. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The world without Christ proclaims lies as truth. Immorality is morality. High-sounding nonsense is science. Philosophical speculations as theology. Their lack of understanding results from being alienated from the life of God. They can't think straight in matters of belief or behavior. They're blind. I think about Mormons. Uh, we dealt with a young lady that was considering Mormonism. You think about how blind of a doctrine that is. They think that man can become a god. 
Jehovah's Witnesses don't even believe Jesus is God. Muslims believe Muhammad uh, and the Quran is of God. Hindus think a cow is a God or your grandmother. But you think, how could they possibly think that? Well, they're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. We wonder how people can be so intelligent yet so ignorant. Apostle Paul is telling us here they're blind. It's like telling someone without sight, hey, look at that sunset, or invite someone who's deaf to listen to music. They can't. They're blind and deaf. They're insensate. Those without Christ may adopt, even articulate, but being alienated from the life that is in Christ Jesus, they have no life with what they say or what they see. That's where we were. We were blind. We were, we're not to walk like that or follow those that are leading that way. It's the blind literally leading the blind. And it's even worse when the blind are leading those with sight. We know better. Senselessness, sightlessness, let her see, shamelessness. Verse 19 goes into this. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. So that's having a conscience seared to work all uncleanness with greediness. They're past feeling. They go beyond the guilt. They go past the pain of their conscience. And their darkness leads to deadness. Lasciviousness is an unblushing obscenity. It speaks of one whose soul dwells in so much sin, under so much dominion and domination that they, he doesn't care what anybody says. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He doesn't feel any shock anymore, no sense of decency, and ultimately, ultimately no sense of shame. The idea is uncleanness with greediness. These are those that are past feeling and even profiting over sin. I think of those in the drug industry creating drugs and alcohol and making money off that. It goes to create pornography, run prostitution and human trafficking rings. And they glorify abominations and are so greedy for gain. They don't care how their work hurts anybody else. That's a picture of the old man, the old you. Now, you may not have been to that level of past feeling or profiting maybe over sin, but the life you were living was leading that direction. Hey, maybe students, just pause where you're at and just thank the Lord for the grace of God. Thank God for mercy. I am what I am by the grace of God, as the Apostle Paul says. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Such were some of you. Maybe you found yourself on that list. That's the old man. We're, not to, we're to put off the old man, not put it back on. That horrible pit, as, as Psalm 40, verse 2 says, he took us out of that, set our feet upon a solid rock, established our goings. We ought to follow the goings that He directs us to. Now keep in mind, we're in the walk of the believer. This is not the matter of transfiguration, of seeing everything God has for us and who we are in Him. Now it's, okay, well, if you are in Christ and you're adopted and you're chosen and these are things that you ought to be doing, put off. Now we are to put on. So put off the old man and then we are to put on the new man, the new you begins at verse number 20. So let's look at verse number 20 at this new picture. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be, that ye have heard Him and been taught of Him as the truth that is in Jesus. You've been taught of Him and heard Him. So Jesus, in your notes, is both the textbook and the teacher. He's also the truth. He's the picture of perfection. You say, well, I'm not so bad. Line it up with a picture of the Lord Jesus. What does the Apostle Paul say to the Corinthians? You that compare yourselves among yourselves are not wise. Well, line yourself up with the Lord and put on Christ. The new man is Christ. Paul did not link our belief and behavior to some creed or code. He linked the picture of who we ought to be with Jesus Christ. We don't have to be linked to some philosophy or set of man's principles, but linked to the person of Jesus Christ. Christianity is Christ. He's the whole thing. Everything ought to center around Him. Line up your life for the Lord. You've heard Him. Here's what He's saying. You've been taught of Him. He's the truth. He's the whole truth. He's nothing but the truth. And now you see how filthy and false, ungodly beliefs and behaviors are. Put them off. Put on Jesus. Repent. Remove. Re renew. That's what He's saying in the text. Verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness 
and true holiness. It's a matter of the mind. When we receive Jesus Christ, we're cleansed by His blood, regenerated by His Spirit. The Spirit of God takes up residence in our human spirit, making it possible for us to have fellowship with God and live the kind of life that God intends us to live, a life governed by the Holy Spirit. We're going to see chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's going to move into things of the Spirit. So we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Verse 18 speaks about ignorance, but now you have the word learned in verse number 20. So you who are ignorant, God has taught us this truth. The word mind in verse 23, again, it's a matter of the mind. You put off, put on. Now specifically, here's how to do it. It's a process of putting away. It's putting off, putting on, removing and replacing, renewing through replacing, putting away some areas here, Roman numeral three. Let's look at these areas. Four practical ways to put off and put on. You, you can't just put on the new over the old. It doesn't matter if you wore some old, dirty clothes. If you're out uh, having uh, working out or something and you just, oh, I'll put a suit on this old sweaty shirt. No, you, you put off and you put on. Specifically, letter A speaks of put off lying and putting on truth. We can see in uh, the scriptural notes here as well, it's the first area mentioned, is putting off lying and putting on truth. Letter B speaks of be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It says put off aggravation, put on indignation. So remember, it's still you speaking, but it's not you lying anymore, it's you speaking truth. Be angry and sin not, holy anger, and anger what God's angry at, that Jesus exhibited in the temple, is appropriate. That's indignation. But aggravation, being angry at what God's not angry at, would be sin. So keep short accounts with people. Uh, let not your son go down upon your wrath. And be sure to uh, say you're sorry and make reconciliation in, on those areas. So it's good to have indignation. God wants to use your passion. He wants to use your words. But don't have aggravation. Aggravation. Uh, Letter C says, put off, put off stealing, put on sharing. As he goes through the text here as well, he talks about putting off and uh, putting on these areas. So verse 25 speaks of putting away lying, speak your man truth with his neighbor, remember as one of another. Verse 26, putting off aggravation, putting on indignation, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. If you allow anger to consume you, I think about Cain, it said that he had that indignation and sin lieth, or he had aggravation and he had anger and sin lied, was at the door. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, it need to give place to the devil. Being angry gives space to the devil to destroy you and destroy others. And then uh, the stealing, letter C, let stole, steal no more. So if you've got uh, some property, don't steal it, but give it. So replace it. Replace stealing with giving. Then in verse uh, 29 deals with that letter uh, D, putting off corrupt speech and put on kind speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Uh, what's the point here? Verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, God so badly wants to use you. He wants to use your words, not to lie, but to speak truth. He wants to use your tongue to speak truth. He wants to use your passion to stand against sin, first in your own life. And then, listen, we're, we're things where God's angry at. He wants to use your property, your possessions, not to, to take from others, but to give to the Lord and others. He wants to use your words to build up. And instead, if you blow up and you use corrupt communication, or if you're an angry, the devil can destroy you. I think about Moses who missed out on the promised land because of an act of anger and disobedience. Student, what will you miss out on because of your anger or your lying or whatever area that's grieving the Holy Spirit? Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost, robbed God, and they were struck dead. Psalm 78, 41 says, They turned back and tempted God, speaking of Israel, and grieved Him in the desert and limited the Holy One of Israel. Interesting passage, limiting an omnipotent God through our sin. The word grieve is a, is a relationship term. 
It means to make sad or sorrowful. It's a love word. When we lose a loved one, we grieve. Why? Because there's no more fellowship here. We miss them. We want so badly to be with them and hold them. When we sin, sometimes we get this idea that God is angry, and yes, He's angry with the wicked every day, but He loves us. He wants to use us. He wants to fill us. But if we grieve Him and do what displeases God, we lose. Now, we don't lose our salvation. We're sealed on the day of redemption. That's what the reminder here is in the text. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Not rejection, but redemption. But we do lose opportunities. We lose fellowship, our testimony. The Spirit of God is grieved because He can't use us. Look at verse 31 as we're wrapping this up as well. In chapter 4, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath, hath forgiven you. The expectation in the text is that Christians ought to be like Christ. God gave for us. God forgave us. We should give for others. We should forgive others. I think about what Corey Tenboom talked about when she dealt with, with bitterness and unforgiveness. She said she would always get this clamor and this, this anger in her heart. And she realized one day when she walked by old church tower, she saw the bell was ringing. And she looked at that and she said, the reason why the bell was ringing is because there's somebody underneath it that's holding the rope and just kind of yanking at the rope. And she said, she learned what forgiveness was. When she said, it's like letting go of the rope. And when you let go of the rope, you don't hear that clanging sound anymore. She had peace. Christians ought to be like Christ. I think of the story of Gandhi. Gandhi was investigating Christianity. So we look at what it means to let our conduct match our calling. Christians should look like Jesus Christ. The world is watching. Gandhi was considering different religions. He traveled around and investigated um, many religions. He looked at Christianity. And as he investigated the claims of Christianity and, and he saw who Jesus Christ was, he was very impressed. In fact, he, he was ready to go and go to a church and receive Christ when I, the story is told. As he was seriously considering converting to Christianity, he had decided to attend a, a nearby church and talk to the minister. But when he arrived, the usher refused him to give him a seat and it suggested that he go worship with his own people. He said, as he left that church and later on would say this many times, he said, well, if Christians can have a caste system, I might as well remain a Hindu. The usher not only betrayed Jesus, he turned a person away from trusting in him. And Gandhi would make this statement, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. See, that's the point of Ephesians chapter 4 and chapter 5. Our conduct should match our calling. Our walk should match our wealth. Here's what Christ has deposited into us. We are His inheritance. We have His inheritance. Now let's live like it. One day we're going to be like and with Jesus Christ. Student, let's start today following after the Lord Jesus Christ, allowing the Spirit of God to reveal these areas that we need to put on, put off, and put away. I'm praying for you as you're taking this class. Don't just take it in intellectually. Take it spiritually. Go to the Lord and help as He helps us all grow closer to His image. I'm looking forward to our next module, module number five in Ephesians 5. And there's some exciting things in that. I'll be following along in your discussion and uh, praying for you as you take this class and course. Reach out anytime you can, anytime you like to, and we'd love to pray for you specifically. God bless.